This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and BuilderMasterclass.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. It's my job to help you, the construction business owner and leader, eliminate chaos and maximize profits. This episode is probably one of the more, one of the most important episodes and interviews I've ever done. It could change or could save somebody's life. Yours, potentially, maybe somebody that you work with. So please pay attention and be sure to listen to this. This is an interview with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. And here's what you're going to get out of this interview. You'll hear about how a business owner said to Dr. Spencer Thomas over coffee, quote, I don't want to wait until an employee dies, end quote. You'll hear a story about what a police officer, a police chief, said to one of his officers after he attempted suicide. We'll dig into this question. Why does the construction industry have one of the highest suicide rates? What is the number one canary in the coal mine, so to speak, when it comes to suicide? How do issues of mental health connect with job site safety? This is an interesting one. There are a few things that you want to think about if you're within say, 10 years of retirement. There are also some behaviors that are early indicators or red flags that a problem is out there or somebody's struggling that you want to watch out for. And then we talk about what Dr. Spencer Thomas calls a crisis inoculation plan. Look, this is serious stuff, but it's happening. All right, maybe you're fortunate enough that it hasn't happened to anyone around you, but it is happening every day. So we need to talk about this. We're going to get into that interview with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas right after you hear from a couple of my sponsors. What's holding you back from experiencing hyper growth in your construction business? Likely, it's poor cash flow. It happens all the time, moving money from one project to fund materials for your next, but that's all changing. Build will pay your suppliers in cash up front and then extend you 120-day terms. Finally, a pay-when-paid solution for contractors so you can experience the confidence to bid on projects you never thought you could. They hear it all the time. Quote, I wish I heard about Build sooner. So what are you waiting for? Head over to build.com forward slash CLE and have your materials funded as quickly as same day. You can also check out their project cash flow estimator to calculate how much cash you're going to need to start your next commercial project. That's B-I-L-L-D dot com forward slash C-L-E. Let me ask you two questions. How many hours did you waste in the last month doing free estimates? And then how many profit bleeds like rework, lost time, schedule delays, and even uncomfortable conversations have you had in the last month because of free estimates. Look, a growing number of builders, remodelers, and commercial general contractors are getting paid to do pre-construction planning and estimating. They're getting paid for their time. They're wasting less time, maybe even no time, with tire kickers. And they're cutting out a lot of the profit bleeds that are caused by free estimates. But what could I possibly say to a potential customer to get them to pay me for an estimate when everybody else does them for free? If you're wondering that, there are three specific questions that you can ask on your next appointment to get your prospect and maybe even get yourself to see that it's in their best interest to pay you for pre-construction services. Don't send out another free estimate until you learn these three questions. Go get your free training video with those three questions over at buildermasterclass.com forward slash script. That's buildermasterclass.com forward slash script. Now, without further ado, this is my interview with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. All right. I'm here with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. Welcome to the podcast. And um, we'll just jump into it this way. Before we started recording, you told me about a situation that you were in where a business owner said to you, quote, I don't want to wait until one of my employees dies, end quote. Can you tell us what, um, tell us about that story and why you're on the podcast today? 
Yeah, thanks so much, Todd. I really appreciate being here and for entertaining this really important conversation with your listeners. So I'll paint the picture. That conversation happened over coffee, as many important conversations do, with someone I had just met. Um, John Kinning was the COO of a 1,500-person uh, contractor here in the Denver metro area, and he and I were happened to just both be part of Leadership Denver together. Uh, when you're part of these leadership networking groups, you go for coffee. So we're out for coffee, and we didn't know each other very well at all. And so you just start asking questions about one another. And I am in the work of, of workplace suicide prevention, which is kind of an odd thing to be doing. And so he was curious about it and he was asking me questions about, well, who's at risk and what do we do? And I was describing a number of risk factors uh, and a number of life circumstances that can drive suicidal despair in people that I'm sure we'll talk about at some point. Um, and he says to me, oh my gosh, Sally, when you talk about who's at risk for suicide, you're talking about my folks. And I said, I know John. Uh, and he said, well, I don't want to wait until we have an employee die. Help me get in front of this. What does my company need to do? And I always love to say that's the conversation that changed everything because this man was incredibly bold. And he didn't have to wait for all of his peers to be doing the work or even to have um, a lot of credible data. This was back in 2013 when we didn't have data by industry on suicide risk. Um, he boldly stepped into the arena and he said, you know what, let me be the first to have a company-wide suicide prevention program. If it's going to help save lives and alleviate despair, I'm all for it. Uh, and I'll share more of his uh, journey and his impact as we go along the way. But that, that was really inspiring to me. Because prior to that, um, you know, I had lost my brother to suicide in 2004, so almost a decade before, and had gone on, on this journey to try to figure out how, how to prevent what happened to Carson from happening to other people. And it dawned on me that the workplace was the missing piece, that workplaces weren't addressing this, and yet most people who died by suicide were working, or they were just working, or they had an immediate family member that was working. That was the system that was impacting people more than any other system, more than healthcare, certainly more than mental health systems. It was the workplace, and yet the workplace wasn't doing anything about it. So when he said, let me be the one, I was like, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, a really important influencer in a really important industry to take the reins made all the difference. And we also discussed a, a startling statistic that the construction industry bounces around between having the first or second highest suicide rate of any industry, at least in the United States. Can you talk about why that is? What is, what is it about the nature of construction work that, um, that makes, makes that statistic true? Yeah, well, I first want to just talk about that research because that was a game changer for us. Before that, we just had, you know, periodic John Kinnings popping up to say, you know, I want to do the right thing here. But it wasn't until the CDC came out with research um, ranking industries by suicide rates that we start to see a kind of a catalytic uh, change. And um, they look at death certificates and occupation at time of death. And again, overwhelmingly, it's male-dominated industries, but construction and extraction kind of flip for number one and number two. Um, and that's, it's the data that then got industry's attention on a much broader scale um, and has made, it, made this a, a really credible conversation. So why? Well, we all knew that it was true before the data came out because we know who's at risk for suicide. Um, men, first of all, men um, represent about 80% of all suicide deaths. So it doesn't take a, a rocket science to figure out, oh, it's the male-dominated industries that are going to be hit the hardest. Um, and so you'll see that. You'll see extraction, which is oil and gas and mining, uh, transportation, um, manufacturing, and so forth. Uh, first responders, military. Um, and so so that was an obvious piece. But then there's also a number of personal characteristics and life circumstances that show up in construction more so than in some other industries. So for example, there's a lot of personality characteristics that make for a really great construction worker that work against people when they're in suicidal despair. Um, namely, that's kind of the stoicism, tough guy, self-reliant, decisive, problem-solving kind of persona. That's a great construction worker because they get the stuff done, they move quickly, 
Um, they don't complain a lot. You know, they just focus on what needs to happen and they, and they power through all kinds of enormous stress. Mm. It does not work so well when you have depression or um, trauma. You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our construction workers are coming in from military service and have a history of trauma that, that kind of bites them in the butt. Um, addiction. Uh, anxiety issues, right? You can't, just like any other health issue, you can't white knuckle your way through it, even though you might think you can. Uh, eventually, it overcomes you. And because there's such a culture uh, and a persona that you don't disclose weakness or vulnerability, you don't ask other people for help, you're the one that people come to for help, there's a lot of barriers in, in the way or for people to say, I'm in over my head and I can't do this on my own. So that's often what we see is that people find themselves in these despairing situations. And sometimes it's also generated by life circumstances. It's actually men in the middle years that have the highest numbers for suicide. And it's men at end of life that have the highest rates. So these are men with a lot of life experiences, but at some point they have kind of a catastrophic life event, whether that is uh, a divorce that's really difficult or a financial catastrophe. Um, and they don't have the skills or the resources to, to reach out. And so they, they have one attempt and it's often fatal. Uh, so that's why it's really important to get in front of this and start to change culture a little bit so that it just becomes, this is how we take care of ourselves and take care of one another. Um, this is just what we do. So that's one thing, kind of the, the culture uh, and kind of the kind of person that goes into this work. Um, so there's other things as well, though. Uh, a lot of times within construction, there's a lot of um, odd hours of work and a lot of traveling outside mm -hmm. of, your, of your community. And one of the things we know that is the biggest buffer, because all of us go through these hard times. There's nobody that goes through life without being brought to their knees at some point with a really hard thing. Um, but it's our, it's our friends and family that come along and come around us that gets us through. Um, and a connection often that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, and that there's, there's got to be something for us when we get to the other side of whatever it is we're dealing with. So when we are separated from our loved ones, not only don't we have that social support that we can lean into when we're, when we're not doing so well, but actually problems pop up in the relationship. You know, if you're away from your family long enough, and believe me, I understand this before COVID, you know, three or four times a week, I was on a plane in a hotel somewhere, you know, um, it's a, it's, it seems glamorous. It's not, it's a, it's kind of a rough life mm -hmm. not to, you know, know where you are when you wake up. Um, and my family moved on without me. You know, when you are absent, your family will fill in your roles. Uh, they'll, you know, they'll take over the things that you do. They'll have experiences without you, soccer games and birthday parties and all of that. And you try to step in where you left off. Uh, military families also know this really well. Um, and it's different, you know, and, and so there's, there's a lot of conflict that also happens in this primary support. So that's a whole nother kind of set of things. And then another one that's really important to acknowledge is that construction is hard physical work for most, most workers, which leads to a lot of pain issues, both acute and chronic pain, which is the definition of misery. And our, our go-to when people are experiencing pain are usually some kind of opiate-based painkiller, uh, perfectly legitimately uh, prescribed at the beginning, um, but then often turns into addiction for many, many people because of its addictive qualities, um, which then is just a whole cascading domino effect of things. Um, opiate addiction is wicked. I've experienced it in my family, seen it firsthand. Um, people just fall off the cliff of their well-being and have all kinds of um, really distressing outcomes from that addiction. And so that's another contributor to why suicide rates are so high. I could actually go and talk about this for about an hour. So I'm going to break <laughs> and see uh, if you have other uh, questions about that. Yeah. So the, the, the demographic of most construction workers, as you mentioned, mostly male, um, the stoic mindset, don't ask for help. Asking for help is a sign of weakness, decisive, problem solving, high stress. That sounds like, well, that sounds like most of the people listening to this podcast. But within that group, um, it sounds like some of the highest risk factors would be traveling, maybe they're isolated, separated. But what are some of the 
who, what would you say are some of the highest risk categories in construction? So for people who are listening, who are leaders or business owners, I want you to tell, tell them what the highest risk categories are so they can say, oh, that's my people. Mm. Yeah. So yes, it helps to, to narrow in, but it also also helps to keep things a broad perspective because mm. sometimes we'll overlook somebody because they don't fit the type, mm. the total typology. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more, you know, also being mindful of just changes in behavior, attitude, um, and mood that people are having sometimes and picking up on maybe some of those less usual suspects, but you know, some other indicators are, um, changes in substance use. So it might not be an opiate issue. Alcohol is also a critical factor related to suicide. And so when people, you know, they go out, but they don't have their usual two or three, they're having like 10, you know, and it's every time, um, way on the point where it's fun, you know, and, and, and they're, they're, that's an indication. So substance use often goes up when people are, are having really difficult emotional experiences because Let's face it. If you're not sleeping, you drink enough, you pass out. If you're feeling really agitated, you drink enough or you smoke enough, it numbs it out. It works in the short run. The Mm. problem is, as we know, you do it too much too often, you have other consequences, relationship issues, legal issues, and so forth. So substance use, looking at that as the key one. Um, Related to that is just increased risk-taking behavior in general. There's this concept in suicide prevention called capability, which basically means I can. All right. So part of the part of the equation in suicide is I want to, like I'm done with this. I I am I'm in so much pain. I cannot go on. Right. That's the I'm driven to this and this is the only way I see out. But the other part of the equation, which actually stops most people, is the and I can, because suicide is daunting. It's scary. It's overwhelming. But there's a certain subset of the population that stares life and death stuff down all the time. All right. They're not as afraid. There's a sense of fearlessness with life and death. So that when you have both of those things together, the I'm not afraid and I'm ready to be done. That's when the lethality comes in. So, um, and again, it doesn't, it's not, we need people who are risk takers. We need people who can stare death down or we wouldn't have, you know, our first responders and our warriors and our entrepreneurs and, and, and emergency room physicians and, professional athletes, like there's a whole part of our community where that's a real benefit. However, when you have someone who's not afraid, who has a fearlessness about life and death, and they want to die, we usually have the one attempt and it's fatal situation. So seeing increases in risk-taking behavior, and that could be you know, anything from driving recklessly to rescue, rescue sexual behavior, uh, where people are just kind of pushing the envelope of life and death, that's, uh, that's can be another indicator that, that, uh, that's happening. And so when we look at subspecialties within construction, just like in, we see this also in subspecialties of fire service, it's the wildland firefighters, the most risk-taking firefighters that are often the ones more at risk for suicide. Um, because they've walked the path. They've walked the path of life and death and they're familiar with it. So sometimes we see that also within construction. It's the, it's the, the wild, wild west kind of construction workers that may be a little bit more at risk. Mm. Really isolated people in general also. Yeah. You mentioned trauma. Can you talk about what, what trauma could look like in someone's past, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, whatever the case may be, and how that how that could affect them. Yeah. So that trauma thing is very connected to the capability idea. Um, And it can go all the way back to early childhood um, averse events. We have a whole body of research that talks about when very young kids go through traumatic experiences, whether that's physical trauma or neglect or sexual trauma, or just a very chaotic, violent kind of home, um, it just gets encoded. And again, we, thank goodness we have so many young kids that find a caring adult or build up skills to live, live through it and they have in, incredible lives. This is definitely not a one-to-one, um, but that those early childhood trauma experiences, when those are not mitigated, um, set someone up later for all kinds of health risks, including suicide, but also even cancer, smoking, drug use, all kinds of things. So early childhood trauma is for, is one for sure. Um, combat trauma, very much so. Um, and we can look at uh, both the intensity of that trauma, but also the frequency of that. 
Um, we also have a lot of connections between sexual trauma and suicide risk. Uh, and we see this in both men and women. Um, military sexual trauma is something nobody ever talks about, but it's a real thing that affects both men and women in our military service. Um, and then any kind of other type of trauma that you'd normally assume to be trauma. So natural disasters, car accidents, all kinds of things. And the, the reason why it's connected to capability is because if you've lived through it, you st you've already stared it down. You've already stared down life and death. So it's not as foreign. Uh, it's that path that's familiar. And so if you have a trauma history, it does not mean that you're inevitably going to become suicidal. It just means you need to be more aware that you have some increased vulnerability. It's kind of like, you know, if you had parents that with a history of cancer, you're just more aware. You have to be more proactive, look for early signs, those kinds of things, and take care of it quickly rather than let things fester. You mentioned some physiological effects of trauma. Um, how does that how does that work? How does trauma, say from childhood or combat, some some time in your past, how does that actually affect you physiologically? Mm. So our bodies are really smart, and our bodies and brains' main goal is to keep us alive as long as possible. So when we are faced with a life and death situation, our body's going to hyperdrive mode to make sure that we're going to survive that and to make sure that we remember everything as, as much as we can so that we know what to do should this happen again. And while that's all very functional in the moment, it does not always play out to be functional later on. So some of the symptoms of trauma are things like hyperarousal. And you talk to any combat veteran or any police officer, um, they're going to tell you, oh, yeah, I know exactly what this is. This is why I got my back to the wall every time we go into the restaurant because I'm scanning the room, constantly scanning the room to make sure we're safe. Um, you know, this is why people also have nightmares and flashbacks, which are really, really distressing symptoms. They're so uncomfortable, but the brain's like, wait a minute, don't forget this thing. Wait a minute, don't forget this thing, right? They want you to be, brain wants you to be hyper alert in case the threat comes back again. Um, and again, while that's functional in the short run, you know, 10, 15 years later, to have those reoccurring memories and flashbacks is unbelievably distressing. Um, and the good news is, and, and it can also, that's another connection to suicidal despair, it's unbelievably draining, upsetting. Um, we have really good treatments that are very effective. Uh, and um, for, for most people who are living with trauma, they just don't know that these treatments exist. Um, one of them is called EMDR. It's like the the most funky treatment I've ever heard, but it's been it's been around for decades now, and it's got a lot of efficacy behind it um, to help people process trauma. I know a lot of people. I work with a lot of business owners, and a lot of them have gone through financial trauma, if you would call it that. I would. I've been there, and oh, it, sure. it's Me very too. traumatic to to be in a financial dire straits and um, just. It feels like everything's crumbling around you. W would you consider that to be trauma that can can uh, have lingering effects as well? Absolutely, absolutely. So there's a whole um, there's a whole body of trauma that is, you know, physically life threatening, like the ones I just described, um, and then there's a whole body of trauma that is psychologically traumatizing and our brains don't know the difference. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, you're probably not going to die immediately anyway of a financial crisis. Um, but your brain tells you, you are, and the, we always say that when the fall seems so great, you know, when the fall just seems boom, you were here, then you're here. That's when your, your brain goes into overdrive. Like, Oh my gosh, we are capsizing. Um, and it literally feels like you're drowning. So those kinds of things or loss of status is another, um, you know, you, you got a demotion or you got laid off. Um, you know, I've gone through this too. And I would say, you know, I've lost loved ones. I lost my brother. I've had uh, different types of trauma in my history. It was the, you know, this kind of trauma that I was less prepared for. And um, it was t completely upending. It was the, it's actually the, been the only time I've experienced full-blown depression. And I watched myself go down the toilet and I do this for a living, you know, <laughs> and I still couldn't stop it. When my business started collapsing, I went into a tailspin. I stopped sleeping. I stopped eating. I couldn't think clearly. I, you know, my only, and my only thing was I just need to work harder. If I just worked harder, mm -hmm. everything would fall into place. And of course that's, a, that's a recipe for exhaustion. So I totally understand what you're talking about. And I think it's very common 
uh, for business owners to feel the weight of the world, not only for ourselves, but the people who um, were, were, you know, or who are on our team, um, that when the things go south, it, it feels very, very personal. Yeah. Yeah. And then when things start to go south, we don't sleep we don't eat, we isolate ourselves, we don't talk to people. We do all of these self-destructive behaviors that put us into a death spiral. Um, yeah, and it's, yeah. I, I've been there and I've, I have gone through financial ruin and it, it, takes, uh, it takes a toll. And if I had to do over again, I, I definitely would have talked to more people, not isolated myself, gotten some help and um, understood that it, uh, it, it's not something you just get over immediately. Um, right. I think well, the other thing for me that I'll just share, because I know you have a lot of business owners on the on listening, um, is that because it feels like the weight's on your shoulder and it's all up to you and you are your business kind of thing, um, that's where also risk comes in because it's your identity that's mm-hmm. being torn apart in that moment. And so the things that I learned, the things that got me through were the, you know, the friends and family that came alongside me and said, we love you no matter what. You could fail at this every single day. You are not what you do. Mm. You are much more than this. And I was like, I am? <laughs> oh, you think so? Oh, okay. It just felt so good, you know, to, ha- to have that validation. Um, and then when you live through it, you realize okay, that was really rough, but I am much more than this. I am, you know, a daughter and a, and a partner and a sister and a friend. And I have all these other things that I love to do in my life and I'll find another way through this. And I, and not having lived through that before and defining myself on success and accomplishment, I, I had to go into the troughs to really understand that in a deep way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to one of my clients who's a, a business owner and uh, he mentioned that in his his town, he, he really doesn't have much competition because a lot of the, the business owners in his town, he, he said, they retired, they shut down. And he said he, a few even took their own lives after they, they got to the end, either after retirement or things wound down. Having gone, I haven't retired, but I've gone through some job changes. I've been fired unceremoniously. Um, talk about, let's talk about retirement first. Everybody yeah. wants to get to retirement. And I think one of the, the biggest punches in the gut people deal with is yeah. they put retirement out there like it's, it's going to be heaven on earth and it's something to work toward and they get there and they're miserable That's and right. that causes all sorts of problems. But can you talk about what people should really be preparing for if, uh, if they're approaching retirement? Yeah. So going back to the data again that we were talking about earlier, we actually see a visible tick up at age 65 for white men. So white men in particular, after 65 years old, suicide rates just climb and climb and climb. And then when you get past 85, it skyrockets. And most of us reflect on the fact that while retirement, like you said, is this this golden thing that we set forth, you know, years in advance and we're working so hard to save for it and we'll relax then and we'll enjoy our lives then. And then people get there. And because they have put all their eggs in this basket of I am provider, I am business owner, I am whatever, that they they don't have an alternative identity. And not only that, because they've worked so hard on these things, they have sacrificed their family their health, their hobbies, like all the other things that bring us joy in life. So when they get to that place of finally being able to live their lives, there's not a lot there. Um, There's possibly a divorce. uh, There's possibly like maybe they have a bunch of money in the bank, but they've got nobody to do stuff with, or maybe they're so unhealthy uh, that they can't enjoy it like they were before. Um, and, And because of that, that is what is that cascading despair. It's not that they couldn't. It's just that they haven't prepared well for it. So, um, so as hard as it is, it is essential for your long-term life satisfaction to prioritize your health and your emotional well-being and your relationships, even when you're a business owner working as hard as we do. Um, because if you don't, it's going to bite you in the butt at some point or another. You're going to have a major health scare. Your family's going to fall apart. You know, major things happen 
that are far more disruptive than if you did your, you know, 15 minutes of meditation, do some exercise, eat well, call your friends, you know. Uh, but we see that as fluffy stuff. Like that's the stuff that people who have a lot of leisure time get to do. It's not. It's like the front part of your day stuff. It's the investment in your well-being long term, and it's absolutely essential. Yeah, I've I've learned that um, well, I've learned the hard way that when you put happiness on the other side of something, whether it's if you're thinking when I get this promotion, I'll be happy. When I get this bonus, I'll be happy. When I start my own business, I'll be happy. When I get to retirement, I'll be happy. Then you're really setting yourself up for failure. Um, I've, I've done it. I can remember driving back from Chicago after having a meeting with the company owners and I get this huge bonus that was like 50% more than, than I expected. And I was, I was frustrated and that scared me because I thought when I, accomplish when I achieve this thing, then I'll be happy. And I wasn't, I was actually less happy and frustrated. And that scared me. That made me think, am I ever going to be happy? <laughs> like what, yeah. What's, what's it going to take for me to be happy? Yeah. And um, so I've learned you have to be happy where you're at. Gratitude. I, every day I start with sometimes 15, 20, 30 minutes of gratitude and really working on the mindset because Mine can spiral out. I can I can spin out um, pretty quickly, and I don't want to do that. I, I'd prefer yeah. to to spiral upward. Um, so, you need to prepare for retirements. Um, sorry, what I just want to comment say? on the money the money thing because mm-hmm. it's huge, especially again with with business owners mm-hmm. and in the in in American culture, we are constantly conditioned to hear more money, more happiness. You get the things, you're going to be happy. You achieve this amount on your bank account, you're going to be happy. Um, And what we know about money and happiness is that there is certainly an upward piece on the lower end. Like if you don't have safety, if you don't have food, if you don't have consistency because you don't have enough money to have shelter and you know, like the basics for survival, yes, then money increases happiness, but it doesn't take a lot. And soon it plateaus. And then actually, you know, depending on what you're looking at, more money, more problems is a thing. Like you've got more stuff to take care of. You've got more complexity to take care of kinds of things. Um, and if it's, if it's more money because you're working so hard, then you've, you've actually sacrificed the things that do bring you happiness, recreation, hobbies, friendships, family, rest. These are the things that actually bring us happiness, meaning doing meaningful things in the world that are outside of your work, you know, connecting to something larger than yourself. Yeah, and that's a that's a tough realization to make. That that's a tragic, um, cautionary tale to get to the end of your career. No kids around, no spouse. The people you work with forgot about you. They've maybe they call every once in a while, but they've gone on. The world has kept turning, and there you are with your healthy four hundred one k, but no relationships, no health. And suddenly you're not happy and um, it sucks. And you realize I've worked for the last 40 years for something and I was wrong. That, that is, that's tragic. Um, So let's, uh, let's talk about job loss. This is something a lot of people have, have gone through losing a job. It's probably similar to retirement. You have your identity tied up with um, your job, but what, what advice would you have for people so they can avoid the disappointment or avoid some of the negative ramifications that a lot of people deal with when they either leave a job or they get, uh, whether they, they lose a job or leave a job. Yeah. So part of it is very much connected to the retirement conversation, which is you have to bolster up these other parts of wellness in your life to, to, to survive that. So your social wellness really good relationships with the friends and family, your physical wellness, your spiritual wellness, which for me means you're connected to something bigger than yourself. You, you can find um, peace within yourself even during very difficult times. You have a sense that there is some meaning in your life. There's some purpose and maybe you don't know it in that moment, but you're going to find it later. That, those kinds of internal and, and external kinds of connection to something bigger. Um, all of those daily practices every day uh, is, what, is what's going to get you through the, any kind of crisis, but certainly a job transition. Um, and then really having uh, what I call a, a crisis inoculation plan. So just like we don't want to be learning CPR right as somebody's having a heart attack in front of us. 
we need to know how to help others. We need to know how to help ourselves well before we're in the throes of crisis. Because when we're in the throes of crisis, our brains, they narrow down. Um, and we, we can see it on brain scans. We can't generate solutions to problems as quickly. We can't see other people's perspectives. Um, we are in a very compromised brain situation, which means we're not going to be the best advocates for our well-being in that moment. However, if we create a plan ahead of time, and this is something you can do for yourself, for other people that you are in your life, you can help your workers to develop this. It doesn't have to be overwhelming, but you just need to know, okay, these are the five people I'm going to call, right? The people I trust, the people who bring out the best in me. Um, I know who they are and, uh, and I'm going to write them down. Um, and, if, and if that doesn't work, here's other ways I'm going to calm myself down. Because usually it's just our physiological reaction sometimes that gets in our way. Um, you know, when we're really anxious or really agitated, and then we can't sleep and all these other things start to happen or we get in fights with people that we don't mean to. So calming our physiology, super important. And that looks different for different people. Sometimes it's just like a massive workout, like uh, go run five miles as fast as I can. Other people, it's meditation, gratitude journal, whatever it is. Some way to calm yourself down just goes on that list too. And then you actually need to know if none of those things are working, like I cannot sort this out and I am in so much pain and misery, how do I find something else? Um, and knowing what those something else are, I mean, it's usually out of your friendship and, and self-containment circles. You got to go call somebody, you know, maybe it's the employee assistance program or maybe it's some kind of recovery program, you know, a 12 step program, or maybe it's a hotline somewhere. There's, there's a number of these, but if you've not made a plan for yourself on, this is the one I'm going to call first, you are then, you know, you go Google something and you don't know what's trustworthy. You don't know where to start. You don't know if this thing is for you. And so this is again, where employers can make such a huge difference. They can bring that huge list down to the three or four things, resources that they've already vetted, that they know are trustworthy, that they can even support you to get there um, and help make that crisis moment a little bit more manageable for people. That's such great advice because yeah, when, when the uh, cortisol kicks in and you go into fight or flight mode, logical part of the brain gets shut down. Not a good time to send emails. Not a good time to go look for things. Not a good time to make decisions. Yeah, yeah great advice. Um, so let's, uh, well, we're going to come back and talk about the connection between mental health and despair and job site safety. But first of all, for the business owners and leaders, um, how do they get started? If they're thinking, I, am, I have a blank piece of paper when it comes to the mental illness or mental health of my employees and suicide prevention. I'm not doing anything right now. They're thinking, how do I get started? I'm overwhelmed. Just thinking about it. What's the first step that they can take to get moving? Yeah. So I'm going to actually give you a very specific first step to take, which is um, to actually go take a pledge. Uh, because when you make a first, like, I'm committed to this and you do it in a way that's public or even semi-public to yourself, that is a, is a, is a mindset start. Mm. I'm making a pledge to make, to make this a health and safety priority for my workforce. And the one way you can do that, you could just do it by writing out a piece of paper, but you can also do it by going to workplacesuicideprevention.com. Um, and that's just the first step we ask everybody to do. Make this pledge. Make this pledge to make this a priority. Um, and once you do that, then then all kinds of content opens up and so the next step after that, that I usually recommend for people, because, you know, construction companies, they love their trainings. Could we have a training, please? We'd like a training. Um, and I'm like, I'm all about the trainings. I got a bunch of them. But how about we listen first? Like any other change process, seek to understand first. So I often slow everybody down and just say, you know what? I think what would be better is if we just spend some time listening to the workers and what they're seeing as sources of despair or distress or what they're seeing as barriers for help seeking or, you know, what's contributing to depression or anxiety or whatever, um, and enroll them in this culture change process. So what the usual first step looks like is surveys and interviews and focus groups and just taking time. And yeah, that might seem like, oh, but we're going to slow the thing down from the thing that actually causes the change. Uh-uh. That's the thing that causes the change. And this is also true in all your intimate relationships, P.S. 
listen first <laughs> um, and you'll get a lot more mileage out of the change process, all right? So, because then people can see themselves in whatever you end up doing. So spend some time and then create a strategy. Just don't drop a cold training off a shelf into a community that's not warmed up to it. It's not going to stick. Warm everybody up. Get your leaders and champions involved. Uh, get them to be credible spokespeople around this. And then have a plan that makes sense from what the data you discover. This is what we do with companies all the time. We craft this plan based on what we hear the people talk about and what we also know are best practices. We marry those two things together. So after that piece, usually the next part just depends on where they're at. So sometimes companies come in the door. It's often tragically more common after there's been a critical incident, after there's been a suicide death of an employee or one of their family members or a close call and people are freaking out. I know, how did we miss this? What happened here? I know people are in the throes of trauma and grief over this suicide or suicide attempt. Um, and there's this urgency, right? To do something, we've got to do something. So I said, okay, let's first acknowledge everybody's trauma and grief. So this is what I would call the downstream first step. Let's take time to acknowledge that people lost a coworker here which was often also their friend, someone they trusted every day, someone that was a big part of their life, someone that they saw more often than their partner. Let's acknowledge that, let blow through the fact that this is a huge critical incident for this work team. Um, and then transition into whatever makes sense for kind of the more, the bigger strategy part. So I always tell people like, you don't have to jump into a training right out of the gate. In fact, it actually can cause harm. If you've had a death, and then you bring in a training that says, here's all the warning signs you should have seen. Here's what uh, you should have said, right? A lot of survivor guilt can come from that. So you got you to move through from the grief into prevention very carefully. Um, if people are not reeling from a critical incident, they're just like, you know, John Kenning was trying to be proactive and get in front of it. Then we've got a lot of other options as well. Um, I usually like to start with some cultural pieces because, uh, you know, culture eats everything else for breakfast, right? So looking at some of the culture indicators for me, how do, how do the leaders model this? How do they prioritize it? How do they recognize and reward it? How are they driving this as a core piece of their company, not just, not just some kind of superficial, this and this nice, we're doing this thing. Um, and when we're talking about upstream suicide prevention, we're really talking about driving a culture of care. Our workers are the most important assets here. Your well-being means that you're happy and we're happy, you know, um, and really having that be a big part of the culture piece and working with leaders around talking points and that and how they can embody that and, and drive a mindset that permeates the whole company. Super important upstream approach. Um, there's others, you know, how do we increase a, a healthy awareness about it? Not a scare tact st tactic awareness, like people are so afraid, but a healthy understanding, like, this is going to impact all of us at some point. How do, we, how do we show up for each other? How do we understand what's happening from a compassion and empathy point of view? How do we treat each other with dignity and respect around these issues rather than the other, those mentally you know, ooh, ill people or those ooh, addicted people? No, it's all of us. All of us are going to go through this at some point or another. How do we show up for each other? So those are some of the upstream approaches. The other thing I always need to emphasize with every company that we work with is it's not all about quote unquote broken people. It's also about half and half a broken environment. Mm. And sometimes that's the way that companies are treating their workers. Sometimes there's discrimination and prejudice happening. Sometimes there's uh, toxic managers or um, hazing harassment uh, really unrealistic expectations for people's performance, um, lack of uh, autonomy or variety in jobs. There's all kinds of what we call psychosocial hazards that show up at work that if companies turn a blind eye to, we can send people to counseling all dang day. But if every day they're showing up into a really toxic work environment, it's not going to change. So there's also this piece of having owners look at their work uh, design and work environment pieces and see if there's some tweaks that you do. I mean, construction is always going to be stressful. There's no doubt about it. But there's other things that you can do to make your environment more resilient, more friendly, uh, and more psychologically safe for the workers. So those are all the upstream ones. And uh, people can start wherever they want there. The midstream stuff um, is about 
you know, we can do all the upstream stuff really well. Sometimes people are still going to have challenges, right? The same with all other health issues, right? With cancer, we can clean up our environment. We can, you know, make sure kids don't start smoking. You know, we can do all these things really well. And sometimes people are still going to have cancer. So same thing here. Sometimes people are still going to have depression or anxiety, suicidal despair, trauma, addiction, et cetera. The key, just like every other health issue, is identifying it and changing course as early as possible, right? That's why we're taught to screen for blood pressure and cholesterol and, you know, screen for lumps and bumps, all kinds of things we're trying to catch as early as possible because the earlier we catch it, the better the prognosis is. So same thing here. We want to catch emotional problems when they're smaller, when they're emerging. And what are the best canaries in the coal mine for this is sleep. You and I were talking about it, right? When your sleep starts to get disrupted, and I'm not talking about one bad night, that always happens. I'm talking about night after night, and you can't even lie down because you're so agitated. That's telling you something. Yes, that's your body telling you something, that something's not right here. So looking for those early signs of when your mood's not right, when your sleep's not right, when you don't, one of mine that I talk about was that I, I lost the ability to taste food. It was pre-COVID. Um, I couldn't eat. It was like choking food down. I knew I had to eat because I had to have energy to do the things that I needed to do, but I couldn't eat. And so that's another early indicator that people are not always aware of. So how do we catch things early in ourselves and also others? And then how do we make that help-seeking, help-giving thing normal? It's just what we do around here. We look out for one another. We take care of these things when they're early. We reach out. To, this is a perfectly reasonable and helpful resource, just like, you know, go into the doctor to get stitches. It's what we do and kind of creating that early identification, early help seeking pathway, easy, normal, and we're all going to take our turns here. And then when the downstream stuff comes, in addition to being there for people who are in trauma and grief around suicide death, there's other types of downstream things too. Um, you know, all kinds of crises. What's our plan? You know, what's our plan to help people on their darkest day? How do we come alongside them? I love this a story that I tell about um, the Denver Police Department. And uh, we, we had an officer who was involved um, in shooting a suspect while his partner was getting stabbed. It was a hugely traumatized situation. And it just threw his alcoholism right out the window. He was just just beside himself and he had a very near fatal suicide attempt and he woke up and he's pissed off that he didn't die. You know, he was that determined. Um, and so they sent him to a locked psych unit, which is nowhere you want to be when you're a cop. And he was just like, he was just done with the thing. Um, and then he went to an AA meeting reluctantly and he had a kind of a conversion experience where he was like, all right, maybe I'll give this a chance. And, you know, if there's a plan for me, show me. And that next day, um, the chief of the police department and the deputy chief came along his bedside in, in street clothes. And they said, Jode, he's very public with his story, so it's okay for me to share it. He said, Jode, they said, Jode, you're part of our family. And you matter to our mission. And we're going to do everything in our power to get you back. And that, that's it. Joe got sober. Joe got treatment. Joe got back on the force. You know, the thing where they carry around a firearm all day, lethal means he served another seven years, you know, and I just always love to share that story because just imagine if all bosses were like that. Yeah. I promise you our suicide rate would plummet. You mentioned some of the psychosocial hazards of unreasonable expectations, lack of autonomy, what I would call micromanagement, an oppressive boss. So many of those I've experienced, a lot of them were in one place, and um, it, it is very demotivating and traumatizing. Um, and that is a very powerful story. Um, I think we one of the keys, I actually just released a podcast on the inner critic, this voice that tends to tear us down. One of the strategies I shared about dealing with the inner critic, managing it, was to get outside of yourself and stop thinking about yourself and think about others. How are you going to help other people and how other people are depending on you? Uh, because the inner critic doesn't really care about other people. It's just all about protecting us from, from failure. Um, but that, that's an incredibly powerful story. So there may be some people listening Actually, right now. I just want to, I want to underscore that piece because sure. I don't want that to get glossed over. It's super important because that inner critic also leads us down this pathway of misery. 
because yeah. you can't ever uh, appease the inner critic when they're at you know on top of everything. Everything looks horrible. You're a horrible person. Everything you do is horrible, right? So, so your insight of shifting out of yourself and helping others is the key. Um, and it, and sometimes that's hard to do when you feel miserable, but it's the key to get you out of that rut. So it is very simple things like intentional acts of kindness, uh, could be volunteering, companies that are in, involved in you know corporate social responsibility. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. When you are contributing to others' well-being, you get helped yourself. It's not just a nice thing to do. It is a nice thing to do. But you also benefit your own well-being when you do that every day. Yeah, I've I've heard somebody say that gratitude and generosity is the most selfish thing you can do because That's right. it it sort of hijacks that downward spiral. And when you're, it, they are completely counterintuitive because when everything's in the toilet, the last thing, the, the two last things you want to do are be grateful, focus on the good stuff, and then do something for somebody else because it seems like the world's out to get you. But uh, the best thing you could do is is hijack that process and to get outside of yourself. Um, probably a good thing to put on the crisis inoculation plan is yes. when when I find myself in the toilet, I need to go do something for somebody else. That that's actually I didn't call it that, but that's what I do. If I if I find myself just pissed off and grouchy, then the best thing I can do is go find somebody who can't do anything for me and just bless them, help them do something. And it just, it works. doesn't seem to make any sense at the time, but uh, it definitely works. And the gratitude journal piece that you mentioned also, uh, it's a practice, especially when you're not feeling great to do that, but it also has you know, tremendous amounts of brain science behind it. Oh yeah. When you just, when you can just find something, anything which you can be grateful for. And on the bad days, it's, it's, you know, it's my fuzzy slippers. It's, it's my don't walk with the dog. I don't know. It's a very simple thing some days. Um, but that just starts your brain searching mm -hmm. for other things that bring you satisfaction, joy, all, all good stuff, rather than your, your brain starts looking around and like, okay, what else can I be grateful for? Well, especially in construction, I found that most I've, I've spent 20 plus years in construction. And, and for the most part, we have an auditor mentality. We're looking for deficiencies. Like mm -hmm. when we walk around job sites, when we're looking at schedules, looking at budgets, we're not looking at and highlighting things like, wow, that, that is just right. That's so good. We're so busy looking for the things that are wrong. It's just part of our, our mindset. It's the, the, the glasses, the lenses that we see the world through, see our job sites through. And I actually had a, a guy I worked for once he, he said these words. He said, we don't need to be talking about what's going right around here. We need to talk about what's going wrong. And he was pissed that we're talking about wins or anything going right. Uh, and in fact, with, uh, in my work with my coaching clients, I typically start the call off saying, tell me about some things that are going right. What are some wins that you've had recently to get them looking at the positive? Because if you look for the negative, you'll find it. And that's all you'll see after a while. But if you start looking for the positive, you may have to strain a little bit, but you'll, you'll find that too. Um, so that, that's good well, stuff. And the, the brain science, again, will share that the ratio of positive to negative actually needs to be heavily more weighted on the positive. And it can't be like a superficial, hey, great job. It needs to be like, I noticed when you went over there and helped your teammates solve that problem everything got, you know, very specific example of what you're noticing that's going well, because, because we're so hardwired for the negative, the negative sticks with us a lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it's, if that's all you're getting, boy, your um, bank account in the relationship is in a huge deficit. Again, PS, this also works in your primary partner relationships. So finding ways to recognize, reward, call out, acknowledge, whatever it is, when people are doing the right stuff all the time, that puts your bank account for the relationship in the positive uh, so that when you have those conflicts, you can, sustain, you know, you can get through them a lot quicker because there's much a better, a stronger thing of like, you see the good in me. You see that I'm trying, you see mm -hmm. that I've succeeded over here. You see that I overcame that thing. Um, yeah. That's a really important part of that's, this too. Yeah. It's, it's really good. It also feels incredibly good. Mm -hmm. It's kind of selfish for you to be grateful to people and to catch them doing things right because it feels good. And you, you get this uh, brain chemical loop going on, and it's just win, win, win for everybody.
Thanks. Great stuff. Um, so there are probably some people listening who are thinking, I've, I've got some, some issues. I, I, I need to talk to somebody. I need to start a conversation. Or there are people listening who are thinking, uh, wow, I need to talk to Todd about this, or I need to talk to somebody on my team. I'm seeing some of the, the red flags. I, I, I'm picking up on the signs now. I need to start a conversation. How would you advise them to start the conversation, whether they are the person who needs help or they, they have somebody in their life that needs some help? Yeah, let me just start with um, helping yourself. So I really always encourage people to develop an A-team, and I alluded to that earlier, five or so people that get you. They bring out the best in you, not the ones that drive you to the bars and get you drunk, but the people who really show up for you and understand you and treat you with respect. Um, And then the next layer is you need to find uh, kind of a mental health support that's going to fit for you. Um, A lot of companies have employee assistance programs, but they have no idea what they do, if they're any good. Um, And often they've gotten to the lowest bidder. So usually they're not so good. (laughs) You know, you get three sessions from somebody in a different part of the world. You know, it's not, it's not awesome. So really valuing that part of the health system as much as you do the others is, is also an important part of the equation. Because again, sometimes we got one chance to get people to the right to the right provider, to the person that's going to understand them and get, get them and help them along their recovery journey. And if it's a crappy resource, then sometimes you've lost that chance. So knowing ahead of time, that's again, that crisis inoculation plan, what kind of provider. Um, I always encourage all my business owners to say, you go call the EAP and make an appointment. And if you're struggling with that right now, check in on that (laughs) because you probably got a lot of bias and stigma surrounding that. Oh, I don't have time. Really? Uh, You know, you can make time. If it's this important for you and your company, you can make time to take one hour to understand how the employee assistance program works, how counseling works, how it could benefit you, et cetera, or even if it's any good. So that's kind of on the, on the, on the, you know, lane of uh, helping yourself. In addition, there's all kinds of hotlines, you know, that you can, you can call and test out to see what they're, they're like. Um, and I'm a big fan of the recovery community. My goodness, talk about universal access to support that has worked for millions and millions of people. Um, we've got 12 step groups for just about any kind of thing. And it's amazing. You know, you can access them online now and uh, they are a, a fellowship that can come alongside you on your darkest day for free. So there's that. Um, so just being more knowledgeable and fluent uh, in the resources that, that exist to you, either online or in your community or through your job. Um, and, and having pride in that journey. That's the other piece we got to get over. It's, it's a courageous thing to reach out for many people. It is a self-empowerment thing. Um, you know, I, I, I worked with the fire department and our, the chief said, you know, to his entire company, you know, I, I, of course, have gone through hard times. Who hasn't, right? Normalizing that conversation right out of the gate. And he said, you know what? When I did, I realized that I needed to gain perspective on what I was going through. My problems seemed too big for me to solve by myself. So I reached out to professional support. And it's made me a better firefighter, a better leader, a better husband, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and to share those stories. So ex- experiment or really go for it and, and benefit from some of these, these resources. Um, if you're trying to help someone that you're noticing is going through these really hard times, and again, you can't always tell. Some people are really good at putting up the mask, white knuckling it, but there are certain life events that are pretty overwhelming for most people. So a financial disruption, like we've been talking about, a divorce, a sudden loss, um, a sudden uh, loss of status, health change. There's common common life experiences that are really upsetting for most people. So, um, you know, somebody's going through one or two of those, you can probably make an assumption that it's a tough time for them. Um, The other behavioral indicators, because sometimes you don't know that people are going through those hard times, behavioral indicators are really about changes in mood and behavior that show up. And for construction workers, it's not always people are crying in the corner. It, It is, people are very, very agitated. So it shows up as aggression and flying off the handle. And I can't handle the stress level that I handled before. Um, They're not trying to be jerks. They are just so uncomfortable in their own skin. We have the saying, hurt people, hurt people. 
sometimes the more rotten they seem to be is a reflection of how they're feeling on the inside. And yeah, you got to hold people up to standards of behavior. We can't have people treating other people poorly, but just know that sometimes that's because they're miserable. And so coming alongside them and saying something like, you know what, I've noticed. That's always just a kind of a nice way to break the ice. Um, I've noticed these changes. I've noticed these changes in life circumstance. I've noticed these changes in your behavior. I've noticed these changes in your mood. And then right out of the gate before they get defensive, you say, and I care about you. And you don't seem like yourself lately. All right. So that's kind of a way to open the conversation. And then as, as soon as you can, turn it from you to them. So um, sometimes when people aren't at, you know, acting the, the way they usually do, some, there's something, there's so, something going on. And I want to be a person that you can talk to about things. And so I'm wondering, is there something else going on? And just be in the conversation with wonderment, curiosity, compassion, empathy, and be prepared for silence. Mm. Again, we've been conditioned for forever that silence is oh, it's unpolite, it's uncomfortable, and they don't want to talk. Wait. You just opened the door to something that's really hard to talk about. The most important thing is that you showed up and you showed you cared. Sit with the silence. Nobody's going to die in the silence. Sit with the silence. They're testing. They're wondering, do I trust you? Be trustworthy. Sit with the silence. Um, sometimes they might fall off the handle. You know, that can happen. People get defensive like, oh, just know that that's often a, it's not conscious often. It's just a maneuver that they're scared. You know, it's a deflection. It's trying to get you away from this conversation. Stay centered, stay caring. It's really hard to be angry at someone who stays with you and stays in that caring mode. You know, you could say something like, I know you're telling me you're fine, or I see that you're offended and upset, and I'm also right here. And I, and I just don't see that, that that fits with what I've been seeing, and I want you to help me understand what's going on. You know, just to kind of reflect it back. Say, I see this, I understand, yeah. and I'm, st I'm still here. Um, and then you don't need to have all the risk factors in your check boxes to go in and ask a direct question about suicide. It is on the minds of many more people than you will ever know because it's not something we see. And so sometimes you have to go and be bold and ask that direct question. And it goes like this. You say something like, let me see if I got this right. You summarize what you've heard. You're not sleeping. You're drinking way more than you usually do. You're going through a divorce. You just lost your job. Whatever it is, those, those risk factors and warning signs. And you say, did I get that right? You know, that sometimes when people go through all these things, they are also thinking about suicide. And you connect the dots for those two things to be together. It's just a hypothesis. You're just wondering. Um, and then you just left up the question like a softball. I'm wondering, is this true for you? Are you thinking about suicide? Very important to say that in a very direct way, using the word suicide. Oh. It puts it out on the table. Matter of fact, a lot of people deal with this. I'm wondering if it's something you deal with too. When mm. we dance around it or, you know, oh, you wouldn't do anything crazy, would you? Or mm. you're not thinking about this, would you? you? You imply that you can't handle it. So by just putting it out there, matter of fact, you just say, we can talk about this. We can deal with this. Um, and then, maybe, then definitely have a plan for when they say yes. Because again, when you set up the question, that conversation that way with compassion and dignity and partnership and empathy, you're much more likely to get a yes when a yes exists. So if you get a yes, the first words out of your mouth should be, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for trusting me. Often they're expecting freak out and rejection and judgment and you give them gratitude, sets up everything else in a much better way. Second words out of your mouth, I got you. I'm a partner with you. We're in this together. We'll figure it out. I'm going to persevere just like the cops, right? We're, we're, you're, you're part of our team. You're part of our family. You matter to our mission, whatever it is. We're in this with you. And then the third thing is I got some ideas, hope in the darkness. I have some ideas of things we can look at together. The whole point of this is, is a partnership. They're the ones driving their own bus. That's another thing we got to just own. They drive the bus of their life, but you can be in the passenger seat offering them up some ideas to take a look at um, and have that kind of plan in place. What are the three or four resources you could offer them in that moment? So that's kind of how I help coach people on how to have this conversation and what to do, what it feels like. I have no idea. This is too big. No, 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 you do. You do. You can, you can, you can start this and connect people to what can help. Yeah. That's so powerful. And I, I like the way that you labeled that situation. I think so many people would say something like, 
why are you being such an asshole recently? <laughs> or will you stop being a jerk or accusing them? But I really like how you, you said, I, I notice I've noticed that, or it seems like, so it's like, it's on me. Maybe I'm missing it, right. but That's right. here, here's what I'm seeing. Does that sound right? And you're not putting them on the defensive because yeah, that that's so, so powerful. So I really appreciate you, you sharing that. And I want to be cognizant of your time. We, we've run over. This is an incredibly beneficial, powerful conversation. We can't cover it all in hours. Um, so if people want to connect with you, follow what you're up to, um, talk with you and work with you, whatever the case may be, where should they go so they can contact you, get some more resources? Um, where can you send them? Sure. Um, I would just send them to my website just to start. So it's sallyspencerthomas.com. S-A-L-L-Y-S-P-E-N-C-E-R-T-H-O-M-A-S.com. And from there, we can get connected in all kinds of ways. I'm in all the platforms. I got a newsletter, all kinds of things specifically related to construction I can connect everyone with. And so thank you so much, Todd, for this conversation. Thank you. I appreciate uh, everything you're doing for guys like me who are high risk. Let's just face it. Um, and for everything you're doing for our industry. So thank you so much for being on here. There you go. Be sure to check the links in the show notes. Be sure to reach out to Dr. Spencer Thomas to thank her and connect with her. And more importantly, if you need some help, if you realize that you're struggling, then reach out to someone for help. All right. It's never too late. You're never too far. Reach out to someone for help. And if you don't have anybody else, then you can text me or you can call me and I will do whatever I can to get you help. Send me an email, todd at constructionleadingedge.com, or you can text me at 859-667-2015. As always, thanks so much for the ratings and the reviews. It means a lot to me. If you could take a moment and leave a rating or a review for the podcast, if you could share this podcast with somebody who would get some value out of it, that would be fantastic. And as always, my name is Todd DeWalt from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time. Are you preparing to purchase materials? Why would you settle for 30-day terms or worse, no terms at all, when you can have 120-day terms with any of your suppliers? Finally, a finance partner built for contractors. Learn more at BILLD.com. That's build.com forward slash CLE. Be sure to check out their project cash flow estimator that you can use to calculate.